consists of three simple rules. The first one is there's no personal attack. Second one is uh, one fool at a time. And the third one is to observe the above two rules. Our format consists of the following. We have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. Thank you, mine was the um, And then after Cheers. that we will have our question and answer period. And then we will have our rebuttal period. My name is Tim. I'll be filming tonight and hopping into moderator if it needs to, but otherwise Andy Anderson will be moderating. And uh, tonight we have speaking Chapman Kelly. Since 1976, Cap Chapman Kelly's Wildflower Works proved that we can save 50% of our air, all our pollinators, and restore a healthier environment with indigenous native landscaping. Chapman's Foundation educates us, the public, we need to adopt this plan and how to do it before the government steps in to compel us. Since 1999, I'm sorry, in 1999, President Bill Clinton established an ongoing committee, including seven cabinet members, to study and implement the exact plan as the Wildflower Works. Wildflower Works has enjoyed international recognition for years. Now it's your opportunity to participate. All right. College of Complex is one of the best ideas I've encountered. I must say it's a particular pleasure for me to be here this evening because it's very obvious to me that I have the opportunity to learn probably at least 30 times as much as any of you can throughout this evening. Uh, I'm a painter uh, by uh, uh, inclination and profession. I've been I think one of the most fortunate painters and possibly one of the most, maybe the most fortunate human being ever to walk this green earth. Uh, everything seems to have given me opportunities to do things that were of importance to other people. And to me, that's the greatest pleasure that one can have in life is to leave a legacy of, uh, of uh, doing good for other other human beings. The thing most lacking, I think, in today's world. In, 19, in 1976, in this studio, uh, which is my studio in Dallas, I had a study group that came there on Saturdays and we did some life drawing and then we they'd bring their paintings in and we had a critique of their paintings. And um, I challenged them. I asked them, what would you do if you were free to do anything on earth? I'll anything. be right there, sir. If that was within possibilities for you, what would it be that you would, that you would want to do? Well, they each gave their answers. And then, of course, uh, they came back and threw it at me. They wanted to know what I would do. I need another one. I thought one. about it. I need another one. Or about a hundredth of a second, and it came to me uh, that I had been a delegate for the 16th UNESCO Conference on Man and the Environment earlier that year. And uh, 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 so I had an idea that there were big problems in the world that were not being addressed. I was also at that time, uh, I owned a art gallery where we dealt with everything from all the major French Impressionists through the abstract Expressionist pop, all minimal color field, new realism, just whatever I, I really believed in. I was the, considered the curator of collections, one of the most valuable collections in that part of the world now. And so I spent a good bit of time flying around with uh, 
uh, the people who at that time, the richest people in the entire world, and helping them with their collection. <laughs> and I found in flying in the private plane, you're, you're flying lower and slower, and we painters are very yeah. visual people. Yeah. We're always looking and noticing what goes on. And it struck me that uh, every time you approach from the air and concrete madness, everything is planted with either grass or, uh, uh, or such. And, and the look of people's landscape is the, 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 that gets the most attention is that part which is individual, the bare spot, the weedy spot, and the brown spot. And so I had been painting in, in my work a sort of a message, I think, to people in the visual art world, because there had been a sort of a great fight during my life between those people who believe that to make a decent painting to make a serious work of art, it had to portray things out in the real world, you know, like Andy Wyatt. Uh, and the people who believed that it had to be exactly the opposite. To make a serious work of art, you had to paint just colors and shapes and space and that sort of thing. And so uh, 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 this seemed to me the most wasteful, uh, use of people's time, their dreams, their cares, canvas, paint, marble, wood, and so on. Because to me, the whole aim of the painter or sculptor, the people who make the visual arts, is to be free. Free to do anything we want to do. To put together anything we want to put together using any materials that we choose. There are no rules. There can't be any rules. And it isn't the material itself that makes something a work of art. It's the concept, it's the idea, it's the abstract quality of what does it say. And these are not bound by any material or other. And I, so I was trying to put together, ever since about 1960, completely figurative and completely non-figurative things on the same canvas. You'll see paintings along the way, like in this studio, where I was doing that, containing the figure development within the lips in relationship to the flat, non-figurative areas around the outside. The idea was to get people to realize that to be inventive, you can't believe in someone's rules and try to be satisfying someone else. You have to say what you and you alone can say, which comes out of your own being. And so it struck me, along with what I'd learned from this, uh, 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 <clears throat> this, uh, uh, the, the symposium that I've been part of, was that instead of painting the wildflowers, what if I used wildflowers to make a painting? To physically sort of realize one of my paintings with the real material, not the painted material. And we were all sort of struck dumb by this. And immediately, because I learned a great deal, the most important thing that ever, and still I guess has ever happened to me, was having been a, a participant in a symposium, Matrix of the Arts, in 1967 at the University of Illinois with uh, a bunch of big names in this world, but I stayed and listened to Bucky Fuller talk on intuition. And it's had to do with a variety of ideas that I've had and managed to be able to get out there that have had a tremendous effect for other you know, on other people's lives. And so uh, if we were to use a new material to make works of art, what would the effect of that material be? What would, it, uh, what, would it, what would it have to do with the environment, with the ecology? And that was fascinating. And that's what made me feel that we had to go on to learn to use this material. I was particularly interested in DFW Airport, which was new at the time. And uh, what was happening with these sort of 
drainage areas which had a, bo a border around the of a black top, which sort of uh, looked very much like the border around the elliptical part of my paintings and the non figure part of my paintings. And I thought, what if I were to try to turn the airport in Dallas, Fort Worth, into a giant painting by planting wildflowers uh, instead of, uh, this was in front of my, my gallery building in Dallas. What would happen if we did if we made the airport look like that? Something very unique and unlike other things. What effect would this have on causing people to think differently, to change their landscape in their home or their business or their uh, offices or whatever? What could this do in terms of water? Uh, I had been uh, Olga and Joe Hirschhorn who you may know is the greatest collector ever of American art. They uh, uh, built the museum on the mall in Washington and given a diptych of land to Lady Bird Lyndon Johnson uh, uh, and uh, sent me down to hang the painting, the paintings, the, the two paintings, in uh, the 20th of January of 73. And, uh, Lyndon Johnson was in a very talkative mood, and we had a number of mutual friends. And so when I finished talking with our friends, we got talking about what I was doing in education field in Dallas. And we talked from, from dawn till dusk, just one on one. The next day he died. I was literally his last visitor. And so I'd been uh, uh, in, in invited down to the ranch a number of times after that. So the idea just really sort of grabbed hold, and I found though that the Texas Highway Department that had been famous all of my life for the wildfires along the roadside in the spring had uh, 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 that I should go to them and learn how to cultivate these these uh, uh, native plants. And uh, they told, they said they didn't know nothing about cultivating them. They didn't know that anybody had ever been able to cultivate them. Uh, in 1929, they had a forward-looking administrator who had said uh, that what you have to do, is what they had to do was to not mow them until they'd gone to seed. That's all they had done, the guy in the plant. So they thought it couldn't be done. Uh, I was, uh, uh, invited down to, uh, 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 to the ranch as uh, my wife and I were the house guests and I was a dinner partner of, of Lady Bird and they had this huge party. Everybody else flew in for it and uh, uh, for Robert Cairo, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, 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 author who had just been engaged to do four books about the Johnson. And uh, so all the rest this nice morning, uh, we uh, uh, discussed this, and Lady Bird had said, you know, wildflowers sure are pretty, we ought to have more of them. But she wasn't the one saying that they're necessary for a new vegetation management system, which is what wildflower works with pointing out and making the attempt to do. I had gotten permission to so use the central road of the DFW airport to see if they could be cultivated because obviously if they couldn't be really managed in a very civilized sort of way, uh, my whole case was moot. And so this is what happened at the DFW airport from, with the wildflowers. This caused the highway department to hire a scientist to really help learn to, to do this because if they could learn to cultivate them in a more uh, 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 careful way, that they could cut their mowing from an average four a year to one a year each year. And the Texas Highway Department owns more land than the state of Connecticut. And so they, they say you know, $24 million a year if they could learn to do what I was setting out to try to do. And of course there was a great deal of skepticism in this. But it worked. We did get the, uh, 
the wildflowers out at the airport, and uh, uh, we did a lot of walking. And uh, it didn't wind up permanent, and I didn't get to do the drainage areas out in the Lumbray area because they got a new uh, 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 administrator of maintenance who was an uh, uh, Army, uh, I think, a veteran who wanted it, wanted it to look like uh, uh, recruits haircut, you know. Uh, he didn't want anything growing tall enough to go to sea. And so uh, we weren't able to carry on with that. But the word about this, this was the front of my gallery building. And it was very interesting because the, uh, uh, we just sort of transplanted these plants there. We had a big flowering catalpa in, in the front yard. And people saw me one morning out there gathering all these big leaves to get rid of. But I noticed that under the leaf, uh, various things were, germ were germinating because it, it, it holds the moisture, I guess, in a little bit of heat. And so they came, uh, people who saw me removing these, uh, uh, these leaves in the morning, uh, on their way back in the afternoon, uh, I was putting it back to help our seeds and our plants to, to, to germinate. And I put them uh, also, we, we had the old Joe Lambert house on Turtle Creek. Any of you familiar with the house? I've been invited to move to Dallas in 1957, just a year and a half out of the Cincinnati Academy of Fine Arts. I went back to my hometown of San Antonio and uh, uh, expected to support painting all my life. I never expected it to support me. But my first show uh, was such a success that I was invited to move to Dallas by a group of people, Marcus and Hudson, all who were. At that time, British people, I guess, in the world, okay. part of my good luck. But uh, we had this old house there, uh, old Turkish uh, Boulevard, the Joe Lambert house, which is no longer there, unfortunately. But we were throwing these, these things all over. But it immediately started making news all over the place. And then in, uh, uh, I was, uh, I guess, through the highway people, I was uh, in, invited to speak in Governor Maine and, and uh, San Antonio, Texas, uh, about the uh, 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 highway people in this country and Canada, because they were and they were just talking about uh, doing something along with their roadside that could save them uh, mowing and make it more much more attractive, and so. Uh, so the, the, the whole idea caught on and started making news. It's really just un, unprecedented and unbelievable. Uh, then uh, the Museum of Natural History in Fair Park in Dallas came to me, and they uh, wanted to have a retrospective exhibit of my paintings. And uh, they asked if I might be able to do a wildflower work surrounding the, the, the building. And uh, uh, Dr. Tom Allen, who the highway department had hired, were, was, uh, 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 was helping me at that point. And so we had the retrospective show inside and the first real wildflower work around the perimeter, around the building. And it was, a, it was an African-American neighborhood at the time. And, uh, we had in Fair Park, you know, the Symphony Hall and the theater, and everything happened there. The exhibits, the art museum was literally next door, and uh, to the Museum of Natural History. In fact, they were taking advantage of the fact that the art museum didn't want anything to do kind of in with, with uh, living Dallas painters. And so they were, the Museum of Natural History was taking advantage of that. In fact, they put up signs that uh, would, uh, uh, while we were out there working, so that the art, art museum people wouldn't know what they were doing, and they would have done something to try to get stopped. But it worked. And uh, uh, so then uh, uh, we had the neighborhood kids uh, to help us. When I did 
primary pillars around the front of the building, where I went from the blue bonnets to uh, Menarda, uh, in order to keep the cool floor, and then I had a yellow area and a, uh, a red area so between the two. Uh, and a very interesting thing happened, <coughs> happened there, and, and uh, 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 the neighborhood kids who came to uh, came to me when I was out there on the morning here to apologize for having run through the wildfire works. And, uh, 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 and they had another kid with them. And you know, they, they asked me if I was a dude who did this. And I said, yes. And they, they apologized to they, they run through them to get on the school bus and make way with the lunches. And so this other one wanted to apologize to him. They said, why? why? You know, you weren't with us. He said, yes, but I took a, I took a, a bouquet of flowers to his aunt in the hospital. So, so we had a wonderful time because these kids and I were out there all the time showing this and busloads of students from all over the area came, came to the museum to see the exhibit. In fact, the Hirshhorns came down and, to see the show also. So uh, this is what the front part of the building was about. <coughs> and we were at that point just shooting for uh, spring flowers. Uh, however, this was in the potpourri in the back of the building. Now look at that. Looking down on flowers, any kind of flowers, where you have all of those leaves that have to be in the sunshine. Have you ever seen that sort of density? You know? I mean, that was really remarkable. And in fact, this area, look at what it looked like, I think it was about three weeks later, two or three weeks later. You know? So we had, we had something going, okay? So this sort of wake, waking Lady Bird up, and Robert Cairo's first book had come out. This was in the 80s, where before I you know, was there, it was in the uh, uh, 77. Uh, and so Robert Cairo's book came out that would show how they made their money, which had something or other to do with his being in office. And that was embarrassing, so Lady Bird needed a publicity offensive. <laughs> so her best friend, Patsy Steve, asked me if they could form an organization where I participate in it. Uh, to do the research that was justified and needed to really learn to manage this material so everybody, every landscape in the country could be changed. Because by then we had learned that we could save enormous amounts of water and, and not use insecticides and fertilizers and all those things that are detrimental. And so, uh, uh, so I unfortunately agree. And uh, <coughs> they were on every good kids because they were out there killing all of the world to move people in the city to not carry a bouquet off and <laughs> have their picnic outside the wall for the world. Actually, we had a mode area, elliptical area, of course, in the middle of it where there's a people could picnic surrounded by the world for work. But they needed tending. As the neighborhood kids had to be identified, we had banners made for them. It was like the uh, 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 thing which is on the front of the building. So anyway, my permission was I asked to open this research center, and we hired Dr. Allen with our permission from the highway department because it'd be even more important for him to, to be part of this organization because. Uh, we were going to get people all over the country to come and join us. They had endless money. And that was, you know, this was a little model, and I'm going to be able to make things that go around the country and uh, 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 get more people involved with this. But they had nothing to show, so I was invited down to meet with Florence Rockefeller and Harold. Bird, her best friend, Steve. 
Maybe you could talk a little louder. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, as the lady, uh, 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 I got the Rockefellers to put a recorder in there to get this started by showing them what we had done. Okay? So we really got busy getting people literally from all over the country to, to join this organization, which we opened on, on uh, December the 22nd, uh, 1982, which was Lady Bird's 70th birthday. And uh, uh, I must say, you know, unfortunately, this is Bonnie Swearingen, whose husband and Bonnie were there. And at that time, he was chairman of Amico, I think the biggest business in Chicago. She'd been a student of mine in Corpus Christi back in the late 50s, I guess, and uh, the early 60s. And they collected their work. In fact, when I first came up with a concept, the idea, when it was first announced, they had me up here visiting with Mayor Blandick with the possibilities of doing things here in Chicago. So they were there for this opening, fortunately. And when they saw, the, when, when I showed them the slideshow of what we had done at the Museum of Natural History, they said, now you have to come to Chicago. This was very fortunate because there was a meeting that day somewhere. I was on the board, the executive committee, and they had the education committee, of course. But there was a meeting somewhere that made the decision that they weren't going to do the research. They raised all the money, and still do, in a research center, but they were not doing the research. And so their ads down in Texas now are Save the Wildflowers. We're not talking about saving the wildflowers, we're talking about saving humanity. Water is humanity's greatest problem, potable water. You know. So uh, 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 I, uh, fortunately, they had no more use for Dr. Allen, who we hired from the highway department to head this, this venture. But he continued work with me here in Chicago for the rest of his life. We came up here, we flew around, uh, you're probably familiar with this area, uh, this square up here. And we thought this could be a great thing for their renewal of, of neighborhoods. You know, something that the neighbors could combine and give their neighborhood a particular sort of character. And of course, it's a very, very challenging thing to do. And the flower is the most optimistic symbol for humankind, I guess, probably since the beginning of time. A few of the things that give an idea of, of how, how this really, as the Hirshhorns wrote in the first catalog about the first exhibit we had about this, as they said, it was really an extension of my work, of my paintings. So it wasn't this, you know, it wasn't so, so separate, it was just a separate, it was just a new use of, of a different material. So, uh, uh, so I came up and they had it all set up for us. And we had five greenhouses of plugs grown instead of just seeds. And uh, uh, we had to have chosen the place in Grant Park, uh, right across the kind of corner from the Amico building, that ran from all the way down to the Art Institute. Uh, uh, where, this is where the Kitties Park is now. And we had to devise a way to plant these things. I'd made out a plan where all these things were grown in, uh, uh, in plugs. But we had you know, different combinations of things in the plugs. So we were able to design this thing just like a pointless painting. And where every plant of each color was to make it, this thing do what I wanted it to do. And so we had a lot of challenges to uh, some problems that I would solve as a painter uh, and visual problems and such and other things that Dr. Allen would uh, have to solve and then and, and, and we would do things together also. We actually put a pattern down as a way of, of making sure that things were kind of where we wanted them. So we had to devise a way to, to uh, uh, you know, the way people get it used to be people just had spring flowers. Now people have flowers in most landscaping, spring, summer, and fall. 
but this is by putting in a whole new bunch of uh, plants each three times a year, which means more watering, growing the plants, which takes uh, electricity and manpower yeah. and water and so on. And so uh, uh, they get a density in there that we could have spring, summer, and, and fall flowers actually growing together. And so the whole okay, thing just grew and changed through the season as I wanted as they were the water. And we were, we were able to manage to do this. Uh, we had a problem with, uh, uh, well, the next time we it over, but we won the first, the first Amendment suit. And we wound up uh, leaving the Park District Board uh, 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 very uh, uh, disappointed. Uh, but he wasn't the only one who tried to take it over. Our greatest problem in Baltimore has been these people wanting to, to grab the attention for it. Uh, what happened was that in 19, uh, in the late uh, uh, 90s, there was a, a uh, very popular place during the place of Chicago because the families would go around the wildfire works. There were some of the toughest nights of my life because I had to be down there because I never had enough porta potties, but that's where everybody wanted to go. <laughs> so that was quite, quite discouraging about human nature. But wildfire works got attention literally all over the world. I was uh, asked to lecture at the graduate school design at Harvard, the Boston Museum School, and the England Wildfire Society. Uh, the Boston Museum. I was a feature speaker at every fundraiser the next spring. I uh, spoke at the Yale the next spring. Uh, literally, I gave this talk at uh, uh, I think some 20 different states. So the wildfire works has been all over the world. But uh, uh, on his first, uh, you know, Mayor Daly's. Uh, the first big party to raise funds for his re-election campaign in 90, I believe the 99, I guess. He had the, uh, 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 the, the picture of me painting out of the wildfire uh, on the cover of the invitation in color and inside the screen. And after we, we, we went to that, uh, they had a group of, of uh, professional landscape people and, and city design people studying grant work during that time. And the chairman of, of my organization, uh, uh, a couple of people that started this organization, and uh, 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 about the way of our work. And uh, the, our first chairman was uh, Mayor Harold Washington. And he died, and uh, then it was Hope McCurney, and then it was uh, Dr. Burroughs, Margaret Burroughs. Uh, uh, but it, uh, 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 so, so we went to this meeting about the environmental aspects of this study about that part, and uh, uh, what it was about was that they said that it's actually beautiful and we and we want to say that the park district wasn't taking enough advantage of what to do, uh, uh, what, what the possibilities were that they should have these all over the place and uh, uh, and get signage up so people better understood what they were what they were about. And uh, so we thought everything was monkey dory. But uh, uh, a lady who was in the widow had one of uh, Daly's best, biggest backers wanted, uh, when he started doing Millennium Park, and we were just waiting for the, uh, you know, the uh, British Petroleum, it was an Amazon, the British Petroleum Bridge goes across uh, the drive there. It uh, was a, uh, uh, we were just waiting for that to open, and we were working with the high school students who wanted to come worked with us uh, in uh, Lincoln Park High School to make them even more beautiful because the next uh, 04 would have been our 20th blossoming season. So 
that we were going to have big celebrations and so on. We were meeting with Dr. Burroughs about that. So suddenly they had a meeting and they were told that they were going to reconfigure the wildfire board and they were going to destroy it. And we found, I found out eventually what that was about. We were just out to be fabricators and we filed a suit. But uh, we didn't have time to do it before they really ripped it up. And but what it was about was it was it, uh, you know, what we call it down there. Uh, wanted to give ten million dollars. Her husband had been one of the big uh, donors there. And uh, my dad uh, Clark was her name all that down there. And uh, Park District, in the meantime, had gotten some grants, millions of dollars, and they were spending trying to do something with Wildfield. And in a complete mess, just not worthless, worthless. And, uh, and costing, costing them millions of dollars. And uh, so uh, what they had looked like, and her husband, uh, her, her husband's partner, owned the newspaper. Of, of the newspaper story on what the uh, uh, what that garden looked like the first year and it was really pathetic. But the mayor and Mr. Alfie may have gone as a specialist. Little so louder. Little louder. You could when you turn your head we can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, all right, I'm sorry. Just speak a little closer to the microphone. Yeah, just speak a little closer to the microphone. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 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 so they hired this guy you know, who's supposed to be an expert in, in, in uh, native plants. And they did a, uh, 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 they were walking across that bridge, and they saw that what they planted in the lily garden was miserable looking. And when they went across and saw how great the wildfire works look, the mayor decided to take that out of here. In other words, it was an embarrassment that with the city was getting free, free. Not only that, but we saved them in the 20 years that it was there. $6,600,000 that they would have paid if they had the same amount of power as well. Where, you know, so we were saving a lot of money because we were really maintaining. I moved to Chicago to do this, and uh, they were, uh, uh, I did it all with volunteers. So that was a, uh, uh, Floyd Swink from Martin Avenue. Okay, John. And uh, Yeshua. Again, I remind you about the mic, please. Uh, it's just we can't hear you when you turn your head. Uh, the uh, 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 Ray Schulenberg and Floyd Swink from Martin Avenue were a great help to us in uh, identifying clients and developing what we really needed to do there. The, uh, 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 the parties down here. Here we are with the Bonnie uh, uh, Jones family. And uh, so the Wildflower Works was a great success, but it was a great success for all the park districts. So their efforts was well with, uh, with the native plants, was with the three pages. We have a lot of documentation. And so, uh, uh, so the, this is Floyd, Floyd Swink meeting with, uh, with with some of our volunteers each year. They come down and we go up to the park or the region and learn about uh, what they are doing with their prairie. Uh, uh, so, so I uh, had a very successful exhibit of my paintings down in Dallas. They sold it very well. And, uh, everybody said, well, now that I had to wait for this lawsuit to go through the federal court, that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, I should move back to Dallas. So I did. And, uh, 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 and then I learned that what had happened was that without the, the leadership that uh, I and my organization were doing, a lot of people, and by this time, this was people were organizing groups about wildflowers literally from coast to coast. I recently heard from a farmer student of mine who went to, uh, uh, to a meeting about 
what they were doing with the native plants in Boston. I uh, talked to another person in, in, uh, uh, in Southern California. I mean, it is literally the Indiana wildfire organization has over 5,000 members. Uh, one group uh, uh, has gone national now, the wild ones. Uh, and yet the, and there's a, an organization in Texas that has 30 chapters. The, what's left now, it's called the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, has a $5 million a year budget just to tell people the wildflowers sure are pretty. <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to tell them that we can save half the water, half your water, the insecticides, fertilizers, and other things that we pour uh, on our landscape. It's uh, just not, not, not a good idea. So what we found, though, is that from coast to coast, I have yet to find anyone or any group or any organization who are looking at, at, at what has to be done to save the water. A few spring wildfires won't do it. That looks nice. But that doesn't save any, any environmental issues at all. You have to remove all of these other plants, these invasive species, and you, when you bring plants from one country or one area to another, uh, those plants have the advantage of developing together with another group. You know, just as ours do, all over the world, you have groups that have, have, uh, have matured, have grown, have developed together. And then you break those up and you move a plant without moving the critters that eat it, you know, the uh, diseases that help keep it in shape, the natural uh, competitors that make it uh, 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 behave itself. They go wild. So our native plants are not there. So little birds don't get the right sort of food. So that uh, without a continuation of native plants all the way down to Mexico, uh, uh, there won't be any monarch butterflies uh, flying that group because they have to eat uh, certain plants, no bees. So at this point, there was a great problem, and that's why I found this foundation. Because no one that I know of, no one that I know of, with all of the publicity that this has had, with all of the organizations <coughs> to coast to coast about native plants and wildflowers, and I'm sure an awful lot of this is directly or indirectly related to what we started, which you know that Jen's I, I learned after I came up here about Jen's Jen's what he had done in favor of native plants. But that did not continue in, uh, in, you know, as it should. And maybe it just didn't have the glamour of a crazy painter uh, uh, doing their work with it and getting all the attention that it got. But he was certainly, you know, uh, if I was a pioneer, as Lady Bird wrote, he was a pre-pioneer of the and uh, uh, but no one is doing what the government is studying to do. That committee that the President Clinton has done has his seven cabinet members. The Secretary of State's on this, so but that's high power. And they're studying to do exactly what we're talking about. And that's replacing the non-native plants with native plants so we can take advantage of the fact that, that the plants that we would use all mature over the centuries and will get along together and without all of the water. But you've got to get rid of those. You've got to make the whole transition. And people are ignoring it. Many people have become instant experts and gotten into seed business, which is really possible now. Uh, but Many of them will sell hybridized seeds, they'll sell anything. And uh, you know, one guy he said, well, everything's a wildflower somewhere. So you start hybridizing and changing them, and you've got problems. Because we really need to have scientists working at this to make sure that we deal with the plants of that particular period, of that particular area, that belong together. And that can really give us 
had a very real uh, opportunity to do something terribly worthwhile. So we're looking for people, groups, organizations to, it's a not-for-profit organization. Everything I have or ever will have will go into this foundation. And its first job is to get this word out that we really have to make a complete change to native plants in order to have these effects. But sooner or later, that's what they're studying, they have to make this work the government's going to do it. Wouldn't it be nice if people did it themselves? Maybe the first thing they do would be to turn off the water outside the house and save all of that money. But there are, there are other people who are telling them, you got to burn it. You don't have to burn it. But that scares a lot of people off. You think of native plants and they, you know, they've been told that they have to burn it every year. They're thinking the fire department and their insurance. You know? So what, what, what some people are doing is, is downright against it. I imagine the turf players people aren't too happy with it. But sooner or later, the government is going to come and, and, and we're going to make the change. But in the meantime, the best thing that we can do is to make this organization uh, able to take all of this interest and mature it so we can do the real thing for us. Okay. All right. All right. Now we'll take your questions. If we can get one of our people to moderate up there. Andy, you're going to moderate tonight, or do we get another? All right. My first one is this. You're an artist. Why is it that a woman who has some beauty already always looks better with a flower either on her lapel or in her hair? I've never been able to figure out why that's so much more aesthetically pleasing. Can you please explain it? Well, of course, the flower is uh, representative of the uh, uh, reproduction process. It's the visual high point of the whole thing. And, and, and that's obviously the only things that can challenge the natural beauty of women are the slugs, you know? And so they go together. That's what I think. <laughs> it, it's as good enough as ever, because I noticed today I was with a friend of mine, she was in a floral print dress, and she looked amazing. She had a, a, a wild, a big wildflower from her garden, and I just looked at her and I said, uh, wow. And it just, it just, you know, it just, everything was done right, and she just looked so amazing with it. And I, I just wondered if there was an explanation, but I think you just touched on it. Uh, I think you neglected to actually introduce us to the real stars of the show. Uh, can you talk about the flowers? Are they the same flowers in Texas as they were in Chicago? Uh, the flowers. Yeah. What flowers? What were were they? The <laughs> there were plants mostly picked from the floor of Chicago book by this one. Uh, and uh, it's one of the green of plugs for me, dumping these things. And Dr. Allen you know, gave some, some, uh, uh, some opinions on that. I, I picked among what they offered to me. I'm not a botanist. And uh, 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 were the, were the flowers in Chicago the same as the flowers in Dallas? No, so a few, but for the most part, you can depend on flowers beginning to change in every 50 miles or so, 50 or 100 miles away, they say uh, that you shouldn't use seeds uh, <coughs> that weren't, weren't grown, weren't, from, weren't, weren't native to that 50 mile area. Back there. Oh, any questions? Uh, we yeah. used to have what was called the uh, Maxwell Experimental Natural Garden and Nature Preserve to uh, try to combine the two concepts. 
experimental Maxwell Experimental Garden and Nature Preserve. Is that correct? Is that over by Maxie? Yeah. Okay. Um, he's asking if you could combine the two concepts of experimental garden and nature preserve. Well, I think that I think that I think that, I think that all of this has to be studied from so many different angles. For example, uh, for us to get this, do this this way, and not really wind up with the same problem of putting out three times the same for a year, you know? May I get him? May I again remind you, please speak close to the mic because we are having trouble hearing you sometimes. Right. We, 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 we had to solve a density situation because obviously to use these native plants properly, we had to have uh, all the seasons covered because that's what people have gotten used to in, 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 in nice and in fine gardens. Well, that meant that we had to have a density that doesn't happen out in nature. So we had to figure out ways of doing it. In that case, uh, it was my suggestion that worked out. Uh, there, there are, I'm sure, technical things, scientific things, uh, that we need to, we need to get these, the people who know all of these things organized. However, we, we found someone in the seed business who we met at a luncheon at the, uh, Natural History at the Field Museum, who's in the business and is plant seed business, and we were talking about this. And she warned us afterward very kindly and confidentially that we should be very careful because most of the, com most of the companies selling seeds as well as our seeds are not dependably really native plants, and that they couldn't resist the capitalistic idea that that you could hybridize them a little bit to make them have a bigger flower, you know, a brighter colored flower. And this is what you have to deal with. And that's why this combination of a painter and a scientist works well together. Because the native plants will have a flower maybe that big. So to have as big a floral display as one that has the flower this big, you know, uh, you, you have to have more of them there. What's the benefit of the wildflower? <coughs> Does it absorb more more carbon or what? What is what's the reason for it? I don't understand what you're talking about. The wildflower. Why is it water. so valuable? Well, number one, you don't have to water them. You don't have to water them. Yeah, so. Well, do you know the water is the world's greatest problem now? No. It is horrible water. Sure. Much of the world people are, are using the river. Yeah. Does it absorb more carbon? Pardon? Does the wild flower absorb more carbon? Pollution. Does it help with pollution? Well, trees are trees. Are, I know, but does the wild flower do that? No. It just well, saves water. It probably does some. Okay. It gives off oxygen. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure about that, but the vegetation is or the lungs are lungs. But I think that's not, there are many ways for them to be valuable. Uh, they are so valuable in so many ways that uh, you probably are going to discover that. Charlie's next. Yeah, I, I realize, Chapman, you said you're not a botanist, but isn't Illinois a tall grass prairie? Chicago area? Yeah. I mean, there aren't deciduous forests, but aren't, aren't wildflowers uncommon? No. He said, are, he said, are wildflowers common in Illinois? <laughs> well, you have, you, well, you have wildflowers in each part of, I guess, the entire world where plants grow, and there are uh, flowers that are indigenous to each area. And Chicago has its wildflowers. And that's what Floyd Swink was the major author of the floor of Chicago. You got a question here? Uh, yes, um, a Chicago 
is unique as far as uh, you can get penalized fine like I did nine hundred dollars for growing wildflowers in my backyard. <laughs> and and I even uh, went to court, just like a kangaroo court, to find everybody guilty because they want that revenue. And Kathy Cummings, I believe, had the same problem. So um, what can we do to offset this or to legislature? Well, I think obviously governments are going to have to learn, and maybe that committee will help them to learn. But these things like a we are not allowed to have anything going on foot tall or something right. is, uh, is ridiculous because uh, you have to look at the advantages. But what this goes back to is what I said first this evening here. Design is what the world is all about. <coughs> Everything that we do fails to succeed because of its design. Design is the language of the arts. So that's why I say the arts should be part of everyone's life. It's part of their study. So they learn and be sensitive about design so our cities will look like it. And design has to do with the way things operate and the way the materials are used, not just what they look like. Over here, you had a question. Yes, where do you reside? Are you a Chicago native? Are you a Chicago native? No, I'm, I'm originally from Chicago. Are you living here now? Yes. Are you uh, ready? There's, there's a, a project to, that perhaps you could do on the southwest side. Uh, by west of California in like 26, they have a, a, a park there and they have a slope and they haven't taken care of that slope. Over there, they have like a park for a soccer field there. There are areas in South Chicago, all the way from downtown, that are this is a uh, a, uh, like a soccer park for a uh, Mexican neighborhood, and I'm quite sure you find uh, a, a really good reception with uh, Mexicans, especially if you're talking about uh, mariposas, monarchas, you know, they like, uh, how do you say? Uh, Monarch butterflies, and like that, that as well. So that particular group is, uh, you know, really um, very, very ready to like do things like this. And the and the park is uh, a uh, a soccer park there, and it's been there for maybe uh, five years, and it has a slope up to a plateau. And on the slope, there's nothing happening right now. There's just like invasive species there. So that might be a, a place where, and it's all the way around this park are several foot, several football fields, one here, four there, so on. <clears throat> so there's a great deal of space on the on the slope. That you have a question. Be what would your question be? Is it possible that is it possible that, that you be ready to take on a new project? Uh, yeah, the, the, the best the best thing I can do. I have all of that in Dallas. I have fell on man-made ice and I lost a hip. And I'm sitting here because I couldn't stand here that long. Or anywhere near it. I have five years of my pains which is where I've lived on since 1957, will never exist. But uh, if I'm now, I might, uh, I might be able to work one hour a day. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So you have I'm sorry a big, that. We have a big uh, uh, suit coming up about that. But at this point, I think I need to be in the business of educating people so that they'll realize that they really have to change all of their plants to native indigenous plants, not just the flowers. Dennis, you had your hand up. Uh, Chapman, thanks for your presentation. You say that no fertilizers and insecticides are used in your native wild flower projects. Do you use anything like natural soil conditioners, mulch, biological pest control, or anything like that? That's one of the things that has changed since I was you know, growing up. 
uh, you know, Roundup was the greatest thing in the world when I first went into this. Now we don't want to use it uh, in painting. Uh, uh, we don't use turbine any longer. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that we have to get into is what sort of things, because I'm looking for working at developing things. For example, one of the things that gave us the opportunity to get the density necessary to have these spring, summer, and fall all the way through, and all of them in the ground 365 days a year, uh, was, was that uh, uh, Dr. Allen found something that would kill the monocots, the grasses, but not the dicots, the flowers. So that allowed us to remove that competition. You know? But that's something very important that we need to get through to some uh, uh, scientists uh, about it. And, but we need to get we need to get people interested in, in understanding how much can really be saved and the benefits of this. So to to help get businesses involved, get philanthropists involved, get, get people involved in many ways. You know, get old neighbor, get a whole neighborhood involved in doing this. Well, right here, you got a question. Uh, in my neighborhood, there's a, a dunes project. It is not dense, uh, and there's a lot of uh, grasses, but also a lot of forbs are blooming, and they bloom uh, from spring through the end of summer. Uh, and we uh, we removed him especially, removed uh, the uh, uh, sweet clover, you know, the alfalfa that was uh, taking over the entire dune project. Um, and so I actually don't have a question. I was hoping that you might be able to go out to Rogers Park and see the uh, uh, Loyola Dunes restor uh, habitat restoration that we've worked on now for about 10 years. That's my comment. Charlie. Yeah, that's definitely at the beginning of your talk, you said in art there are no, well, you're a graduate of the pretty traditional Philly uh, art school there. And then you say that I see you're, you're pretty an academic painter. We're looking, judging by what I can see. And then you turn around and you said there are no rules, and there can't be any, any rules in art. What do you mean by that? Louder, Charlie, please repeat your question. He had trouble hearing. Are there rules in art? Are there rules in art? Okay. All right. Anything you want to create. Speak into the mic. Speak into the mic. Unfortunately, some people thrive under rules. And the most important thing that ever happened to me, I mentioned earlier, Nature the Art Symposium was where Bucky Fuller was a part of it, and Saul Bellow, and first coming here, John Cage, all these people, and I, uh, they were looking at what is happening in, in, in the art educational field in the fine arts. And, see, the fine art field, the visual art field, quite frankly, has turned into one giant whorehouse. <laughs> the artists have nothing to do with, with what is selected, and show museum directors and museums have got eighty thousand dollars in the eighties. That's not that long ago. And now pay over a million dollars a year because what the job what the whole class now is to make some very rich, super rich, nouveau rich people allow them to manipulate the art market to make big fortunes. And there are books written about this, and it's really, very, it's really very tragic. But a lot of this happens because of the change in the art education. It used to be that we studied with one with the three previous, with the, with the recognized artists of the previous generation. You know, we gave up just a little bit of their time, one afternoon a week, four months out of the year, maybe. You know, it wasn't the library of teaching. Well, now. We've got these giant art, school, uh, art departments and universities, and they're professional teachers. They don't tell them the truth, so they can decide whether they should try to you know, spend their whole life painting and support it 
chicken hamburger, the dragon chaps or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, now they think there'll be enough teaching jobs that everybody can teach full time. Mm -hmm. But so there's places in the summer. But that, those people, it's sort of changed the art world completely around in the art world now. That's another purpose after we get this business about the native plants straightened out. Then we're going to get into the art world problems. Question back there? <clears throat> back, yep. back here. If you, uh, how do you deal with weeds? Um, weed. One of the problems. One of the problems with what is happening, and you can drive around the park. Again, use the mic, please. And, and, and the roadsides in Chicago. <coughs> and you'll see, but they'll put up signs that this is a nature area, where all they're doing is stopping maintaining it and throwing out a few wildflower seeds. And they look like hell. So take a look. Right down Lakeshore Drive, and there are many hundreds of acres that they're just saving them the money to maintain by putting up a sign that says nature area, you know, and you'll have 1% of the area covered for one week uh, by, by a few wildflowers. And that's it. That's it. And it's a mess. And all these and people are making their fortune uh, and saving fortunes, not doing the real thing. I'm sorry, maybe you didn't hear me. I'm wondering about in your areas, the wildflower work areas, how do you manage the wheat, any weeds? Do weeds come up around the flowers and how do you deal with that? Yeah, you, well, for one thing, uh, 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 just, just the old fashioned digging them out, pulling them out, uh, that sort of thing. So you have volunteers? Uh, pardon? Do you have volunteers who weed? Yes. That, that's what I was up here. I worked at that seven days a week. Thing. You, first of all, you prepare it. You prepare it by putting, now they put black plastic over it and, uh, and, and, and get everything to, and all the seeds to extend themselves. But the wind blows in seeds. Seeds that drop by birds, by animals, boats, and our clothes. You know? So you always have to maintain. One of the biggest problems I know of today is that people are selling this whole thing short just to save money. And what that means is they give it no maintenance whatsoever. They just put up, as I say, the sign and uh, 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 throw out a few seeds. And they look like hell. You know? So they've got to maintain it. And people need jobs in this country. And by golly, you know, you don't grow anything without weed, whether it's a corn crop or whatever. But these people have the, there are all these pretensions that have sold people in getting in halfway. You see what I mean? And just throwing out a few spring flowers. It looks, it's a, it would look kind of nice for about a week in the summer. You know, in the spring. But that's all it does. It doesn't save water. It doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't make them look good all the way through the season. But we prove that that's possible. And without water. We literally have the water disconnected for years. Bye. Could you please discuss the uh, purpose of flowers in general and why they are so different from the rest of the plant? Is the flower, why are they different? Yeah, why, and what's their purpose? Flowering well, the flowers make the, the flowers make the seed. That's evolution. And they, they attract the uh, insects and uh, uh, bees. They attract the pollinators. And uh, they feed the pollinators. That's where you get honey. And that's how you get all of your food crop. Without the pollinators, without this whole system that developed in this country and literally all over the world, without that, without that uh, uh, working properly, uh, Human beings couldn't live on this earth. And so flowers are very important to the whole system. Because they're the beginning of the system and uh, you know, such an attractive point of the whole system of living plants. 
why do they differ from the rest of the plant? Why are they so very different and much more beautiful than the rest of the plant? They're not burning. Yeah. He's asking why are flowers different from the rest of the plants? I think it's because they are different. They're just a different part of the plant. If I were a botanist, I could probably give you a lot of answers. But I, I, uh, I, I was busy about bleeding and uh, just putting in the physical labor of uh, making it look neat and weed free and, and so on. But uh, flowers are well, okay. flowers are a high point. They're, they're one of the greatest symbols. Thank you. Again, I ask you to speak into the mic, please. It's just, we're not, we're, you keep drifting off. The flowers, flowers are terribly important because they're symbols. They're the most optimistic symbol that we have, I think, visually. You don't see a woman adorned in ferns. Question over here? Yeah. So, back to this question back there. So, the the flowers that you had for so many years in Grant Park, those were all manually weeded? Oh, yeah. Okay. And that's the only way, that's the best way, to, that's the way you suggest to achieve those results? Well, there, there, are several, there are several ways of weeding. One is that if you have a, a herbicide, which used to be like, you know, the and this man, often based on the vinegar that you can go in and spray it each individual, each individual plant that you need and you don't want to grow. You can grow it. Uh, uh, but you, you, you have to get rid of them by hook or crook. You can also do the same thing like and keeping it from making uh, seeds for the next year. If it's an annual And the other one is, when there's a chart, there are charts that exist for, temp for temperature zones. For, you know, they have wavy lines that go across the country, different colors, and they'll say like, you know, this area may be a zone five, and to go up north, it's a zone four, to go down south, it's a zone six. For growing different types of plants in your temperature, in your temperature freezing area. Is there such a, such a chart for the different wildflowers, like this is a, a black-eyed Susan is native to this wiggly area, and uh, coneflower is native to this area. So it's obvious that whatever's native in New England is not native in Seattle, which is not native in Houston. So how do we know? How do anybody? How does anybody know what's native in your area? Well, this is a very, very important thing that we have to we have to get more scientists involved in solving these things and making certain that the plants there there are banks what they call the seed banks that have kept seeds for particular periods and uh, we have to get those seed banks to cooperate with uh, and help. Uh, so more and more of those seeds there are out of the period. And this is what the FDA was warning us about. Is that a lot of the seeds being sold are not really native. You know, or they don't have it. And, and a study of this sort of thing is, is, is very necessary. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I'm not a scientist, but it's all here. Other questions? Okay, let's Who else has a question for our speaker? <coughs> All right, let's you. go to rebuttals then, Andy. No questions, and uh, we'll go to rebuttals. Give our speaker a hand. You can sit down in some area and we'll have rebuttals and questions. Yes. Sit down. Can you the slide projector? Hold on. The wire's caught here. I'll get it. Okay, watch yourself. We didn't want you to trip. All right, rebuttals. If nobody's going to go ahead.
Let's get started. Get a count, get a count, Andy. Hold on, we haven't apportioned out the time yet. Oh. Andy? All right, Andy, let's apportion out the time. Okay, uh, who wants to give a rebuttal? Raise your hand and we'll get a count here. We've already got one over there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Call it ten people. About five minutes. Start five minutes apiece. Okay. Less, depending on what you think. All right. Okay, I, I just wanted to say what I already said. If you get a chance to go to Rogers Park, uh, the beach at Rogers Park at uh, Pratt Avenue, there's a pier there, and on the north side of the pier, there's a beautiful, beautiful habitat restoration um, uh, that you can see. It's got a lot of grasses and a lot of flowers. Uh, but it's not dense with flowers, but the flowers are growing in a natural way. And we have been stewarding the, this habitat restoration for about 10 years. And we moved all of the alfalfa, which was, a, uh, a, there was nothing out there that ate the alfalfa because it came from Europe. And so um, it, it would really be um, elevating for you to go see it because it is, really a gorgeous place. Um, it's, uh, it's at the end of Pratt Avenue, uh, at Lake Michigan and Pratt Avenue. Thank you for your presentation. It's very simple. You work with nature, not against it. What are flowers good for? Flowers propagate. So that's what it's about. Uh, the problem is we need to be educated about this. So what are we doing? Uh, go down to uh, Brazil, chop down the rainforest, and, and grow, grow crops so some cows can eat crops. It's stupid, absolutely stupid. Round it. I use Roundup. What I use it for is a little, little crack. I don't use it on an entire field. It's a whole different thing. So we're doing, we're doing very stupid things. Um, I, I think there are probably still, probably still a few people that smoke, right? Every one of my family smokes. They're also dead. And the problem is, once you're hooked, that's a problem. Work with nature. It's a lot easier. It doesn't cost as much. You have to do a little work, but it's definitely worth it. So thank you. Let us show you what's right outside our window. Let us show you what's just a walk away from home to when the sun always asks each morning, do you want to go? There are trees and streams and endless peaceful fields so green that we get lost within dreams they yield to where the moon always asks each eve, ain't it all so sweet? We don't pick the flowers, we let them grow in the earth they grew up in. We've been learning how the soul can't be hurt or moved from it. Let us show you what's just right outside our window. Let us show you what's just a walk away from home, to when the sun always asks each morning, do you want to go? There are trees and streams and endless peaceful fields so green that we get lost within the dreams they yield, to where the moon always asks each eve, ain't it all so sweet? We don't pick the flowers, we let them sow their wild oats, the earth they grew up in. We've been learning how the soul is resilient when we join together to protect it. Thank you for your presentation, Chapman. I want to thank you for your very stimulating and interesting presentation. I was glad that you talked about Lady Bird Johnson, since I remember when she was first lady, she also was interested in wildflowers and did her best to get America interested in it too. Um, I also was interested in what you had to say about some of the black play that goes on between people who champion either representational art or abstract art. 
And I recall that Harry Truman was one of the few presidents we've had who liked to drop into the National Gallery. Oh, okay. The problem with that was he was a strict representational art man. And anything like Jackson Pollock or whatever, that's what he used to call ham eggs art. And that's not quite how I feel about modern art. I understand some of his criticism, like for example, before the Art Institute built the modern wing, they had a much smaller modern art exhibit in, inside, inside the main building. And I walked, walked into it one day and walked past this plastic bench that was leaning up against the wall that was called acrylic number one. It's a plastic red bench. And I'm afraid my views coincided with President Trump on the subject of abstract arts. I didn't understand the plastic bench at all. Um, to my friend Frank, my friend Bob Lichtenberg, who asked, um, you know, kind of what the purpose of a flower is, he has referred to the uh, to the uh, parable by James Thurber called the last flower. Thank you. My name is Dennis Nelson. Our essential pollinators include introduced European honeybees native bee species like the American bumblebee and rusty patch bumblebee, butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, and beetles. Attracting native pollinators, protecting North America's bees and butterflies, 2011, by the Xerxes Society, is a comprehensive guidebook for gardeners, smaller farmers, orchard owners, beekeepers, naturalists, environmentalists, and I'm both of those, and public land managers on how to protect and encourage the activity of the essential and native pollinators of our continent. This volume presents a thorough overview of the problem, along with positive solutions for how to provide bountiful harvests on farms and gardens, maintain healthy plant communities and wildlands, provide food for wildlife, and beautify our landscape with native wildflowers. This reference book provides detailed garden plans and techniques about how to create flowering habitats to attract a variety of these essential pollinators, help expand pollinator populations, and provide pollinators with nesting sites. In fact, I tried to get, get a book from the uh, Harold Washington Library Center as a show and tell, and all the copies were uh, checked out, and I put one on reserve, and I still hadn't gotten it by this evening, so it's a pretty popular book. Thought maybe Chapman would have it. Uh, tonight, but that's great. You can check it out at the library. The Obama administration had a White House Pollinator Health Task Force. It aimed to dramatically reduce European honeybee colony loss over the next decade and increase the population of monarch butterflies while restoring about 7 million acres of land over the next five years, which can serve as essential pollinator habitats. I submitted written public comments to the White House Pollinator Health Task Force. I recommended that indigenous native landscaping can be done at city parks, urban neighborhood gardens, schoolyards, even railroad right-of-ways and uh, cemeteries. We can also include national parks, national forests, and national wildlife refuges. But I also advocated a total and permanent ban on the manufacturing and selling of a class of hazardous systemic chemical pesticides called neonics, which have been linked to the decline of bee populations. The use of neonics on tomatoes, berries, almonds, and oranges exposes bees to harmful insecticide levels. Making America toxic again. The Trump administration abolished the White House Pollinator Health Task Force. Surprise, surprise. I'm sure it is to, it's no surprise to anybody here. The Trump administration also reversed a ban on the use of GMO crops and toxic chemical and neonic pesticides in our national wildlife refuges. This bad policy decision ended a two-year ban from the Obama administration brought in following a lawsuit by environmentalists. This sort of industrial agriculture has no place on our national wildlife refuges dedicated to wildlife conservation and the protection of some of our most valuable species, vulnerable, and vulnerable species as well. Remember that I am both a naturalist and environmental activist. I have visited the DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge in Iowa, Nebraska, the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, the J. N. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge in Florida, and the Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge in South Texas. 
The Trump administration is also attacking the protections for imperiled species under the Endangered Species Act. An excellent case in point is the highly endangered rusty patch bumblebee that I mentioned earlier, which can be found in the eastern states and the upper Midwest. Just one day before the rusty patch bumblebee was to receive federal protections under the Endangered Species Act, the Trump administration suspended those protections by putting the listing on hold. Bees are the linchpin of our country's food system for the critical role which they play in pollinating our commercial crops with an annual economic benefit of about $15 billion annually. But having lost almost 90% of their range in the past 20 years, bee species and populations are on the edge of extinction. The rusty patch bumblebee is among the most critically endangered species in the country. While it was on track to be saved, the delayed and potentially denied protective status keeps the rusty patch bumblebee on the path of extinction. Everybody who loves to eat, grows food, or both has a stake in taking steps to save our essential pollinators and enhance our food security. And Chapman, you're certainly a part of the solution, and I thank you for it. And I've seen your handiwork in Grand Park. It's very impressive. Again, thank you very much for coming. Um, they have uh, two statues downtown. One is by the uh, federal building, and it has a statue not by the federal building, by the city hall, across from city hall. And it's a Picasso, and when you look at it, it doesn't look like art at all. I don't know what the hell it looks like. But there's no emotional satisfaction in looking at it. And then if you look a little south to another building, there's a Miro on the other side, and that's about equivalent to the Picasso statue. Okay. And I call that art with a capital F. But art itself has a very strong emotional component. And that's what art does. It gets you in a certain mood, in a certain set of uh, mind where your emotions are all worked up to do certain things. And that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make life richer and it's supposed to get, to get involved in one form of activity or another. Like if you listen to uh, Marshall music, it, the ideas get you ready for war emotionally. And when you look at art, good art, it has that emotional component where you want to go out and do something. And we're not just uh, cognitive, co cognitive uh, individuals, but also emotional individuals. So art helps in that direction. For instance, they had a very nice mural in Rockefeller Center in New York that Diego Rivera painted. And when Rockefeller seen the painting, he looked at it and it had Lenin in there and it had Marx and it had people doing work in a factory, like in Detroit. And that uh, painting is in the Detroit Museum now, and that's a very interesting painting because it, it has the feeling you want to get, get involved with labor in one form or another and do something about the lousy conditions of labor. And if you look at other um, forms of art, like for instance Van Gogh, before he became a little more abstract, he had the paintings of the potato eaters in the Netherlands. And you look at the face, you see all this smooth on their faces and they're real dirty because they used to work down in the mines. So you get an emotional feeling how it is to work in the mines. So art has its place in the world and it's a very interesting place 
because it gets you more interested in life itself. And I think the same thing with flowers and so forth. It helps us to attract us to doing something in the real world, which is part emotional. Well, welcome to the College of Complexes. <laughs> Originally, this was called the College of Simplexes, but then it became very complicated. Um, I don't like the term natural, like because I re from my point of view, natural is just a snapshot in time. For example, take the humans. Humans grew up out of Africa, spread around the world. People live in the Arctic, a little different from people living in the desert, different from people living in the tropics. You know, I mean, what we say is natural is just a snapshot. It's like when the Europeans came and looked around. You know, who's not to say that if, if you know, people weren't around for another 100,000 years, that a particular plant or something may have gone all over the world, you know? And it would be natural in whatever its environment was, okay? Natural, uh, I don't like the term. Um, the other thing is, I was at a, at a lecture over in, uh, well, it doesn't matter. The lady was talking about about soil, composting, plants, and earth. And the lecture went something like this. Many, many, hundred years ago, people thought soil was basically humus, minerals, and water. And then they discovered that, no, it was more complicated than that. There were also like essential elements in there, principally phosphorus and nitrogen, right? Oh, and lo and behold. And then they discover that there are actually microorganisms in there that take part in everything, okay? And then uh, she went on to the idea of how plants and the, what they call the biome, the biosphere possibly, the biome that's in the soil of these microorganisms, how there's a symbiotic relationship between them and how the plants provide the, the, provide the, the, the bugs with sugars and, they, and, the, and the bugs provide the plants with digested soil material, nitrogen, phosphorus that the plant doesn't take up directly. And there's a symbiotic relation. This whole thing is linked. And they were talking about, of course, the suffering farmland. And the thoughts come to mind that you can actually have a, 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 let's say a vegetable, a cauliflower, a broccoli, a tomato, a plum, that's grown in a certain soil that lacks a certain, a certain thing, you know? And it is, a, it is, to all appearances, a healthy plant, but it's not really, you know, it lacks. It lacks something that if it was grown somewhere else, it would have. And the only, the, the only, not the only, the example that I know of is that somewhere in India, maybe Assam, if that's the right word, they have, uh, they suffer from, hype, they suffer from, um, hyperthyroid? Not hyperthyroid, the, the uh, goiters. They suffer from goiters because their soil lacks iodine. All right? So they don't get the iodine they need at that, and it's like they grow healthy plants, but the soil doesn't have to give, so these are really not healthy plants. And then you come to us, and we are like taking supplements, vitamins, and things like that, because we are grown in a situation, economic as it is, where we are not, we look to all appearances to be healthy, but in reality, we're not. We, we need vitamin Bs or vitamin Ds or something else, add minerals, trace minerals, zinc, uh, magnesium, to actually make us healthy even though we look healthy. Um, but then the other thing that brings to mind is in the gut, now they're very into the gut biome and the digestive process, which is that in our gut, we have all these organisms that take our food and proceed to digest it of course, our body provides enzymes and other things that help break down the food, but it's all like rolled into one, and in many ways, we're like plants, in the sense that we feed not directly off of what we chew. We feed off of the mash 
that's in our digestive, that's in our digestion, that is being pre post digested, pre digested, that is being worked on by all of the enzymes we produce and all of the biomass that's in to make a product that can be passed through the intestinal wall and into our bloodstream to make the rest of us go. So interestingly, our gut, with all that shit that runs through it, is very similar to the soil and the plant and the and we're just creatures of earth. Thank you. Okay, Andy. I'm going to split my five minutes in two segments to get an announcement on two different spots of this tape. I'll just take two minutes right now. Uh, what our speaker's been talking about tonight is uh, what many people consider the number one issue facing America, climate change, and the devastation of plants, animals. This book is a little book called Unprecedented Climate Mobilization by Elizabeth Woodworth and David Ray Griffin. If you don't have time to read 50 or 100 books on what our speaker was talking tonight and all the other people around the world that are trying to save the corals, uh, save the bees that are dying off, uh, climate change is causing uh, all kinds of species to shift. They can't grow where they used to, right? So um, this book, Unprecedented Climate Mobilization, is the best thing I can recommend. It's a short little book, about 100 pages. It's a summary of a massive amount of data from all over the world. There's two websites, well, actually three, but there's two great websites. One of them is called Common Dreams. That's the number one news site that's independent. They post articles about climate change and everything else and good things that people are doing all over the planet to make a difference. I'm going to be talking about that in two weeks from tonight for those of you that are interested in uh, helping save the climate and the planet. Come two weeks from tonight. The second website is called Truthout, T-R-U-T-H-O-U-T. They have, uh, it's a .org, I think. It's Truthout. Truthout and Common Dreams both have massive archives of up-to-date information from all over the world of people that are working for uh, solving the climate problem. And they're talking about planting all kinds of different kinds of plants and trees and everything to take carbon out of the atmosphere, among other things. So there's, there's all kinds of good stuff going on that the American press, does, the corporate media, doesn't have time to tell us about anymore because they have to talk about the latest 7-Eleven robbery every night. So uh, you can't learn this stuff by watching the media in America. Uh, log on to Common Dreams Truth Out, and uh, there's another website called Want to Know Info, 12 different disciplines on there uh, of people working for a brighter future, a collective effort. It's worldwide. Thank you. Go ahead. you got five minutes. Uh, no, I, I won't take five minutes. No? No. I just wanted to say that I personally am very honored to have have met you here. Um, I really think, I hope everyone realizes the importance of what he's done. <clears throat> and um, I guess personally I would just share that when we bought our house 20 years ago, I was out in the garden all, <clears throat> all day long and I made some mistakes. Um, I didn't know about natives at the time, I was planting annuals and I spread a packet of yarrow seeds down, not, not knowing that they were the kind that were going to spread all over through the lawn and everything. And then I read that the, the Romans used to use the, the green of the yarrow to make bandages. I, I can't believe that was true, but I read it. <clears throat> and oh, we had some day, common daylilies growing alongside of the house, and I was trying to do everything cheaply, so I thought, I'll just spread these around everywhere. I put them in rows along around along the the neighbor's um, property, only to find out that they were going to spread into the neighbor's yard, and the, na the neighbors would have to put down barriers to you know keep them from spreading. So I made a lot of mistakes. We don't water on the positive side. We haven't watered in a few years. We're proud of that. Um, lots of really tall. Uh, butterfly attracting, like a butterfly weed, we've got those things going. So actually it's all very beautiful and it's doing some good. We don't mow the lawn much to our neighbor's uh, consternation because we're afraid of disturbing fireflies. I mean, we mow it occasionally, but we've had our legal battles. Um, 
But anyway, we're on the right track, and I, I just want to thank you, and it's been an honor to hear you. Thank you. Let's, let's stay in touch. Would you please uh, give us your name and address, uh, at least email address and phone number? Okay. What's it for? Who's us? All right, Charlie. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. All right. Let's thank our speaker. Is he set up? I'll sit down. I'll be collected here as usual, and we've got a lot of time today. So I ain't going to be cut short here. Um, I heard earlier, amazingly enough, somebody didn't understand the value of flowering plants. It's the singular most spectacular event in the, his the biological history of this planet and the ecology of this planet was the development of flowering plants. Before that, it was largely a world of ferns. And I've seen paintings of what the world looked like didn't have trees like we had, and there was an extinction, and and the flowering plants won. And I, we're very glad that happened. It, it opened up infinitely more possibilities than living in a fern world. Um, another thing I would recommend is, uh, I, having lived on the Great Plains, I found myself as a young man, and on a farm, I began studying what is it what I was a prairie and the prairie runs from the tall grass in the east to the short grass in the west it's a unique ecosystem um, as a matter of fact I even wonder to what extent uh, these flowers can gain hold given the no granted the, tall, the grasses aren't everywhere. They're not in every single terrain. But once they are, were, were in charge, that's why the early pioneers, when they came here, couldn't couldn't plow the land. They needed the development of the steel self-scouring plow that John Deere invented, that enabled them for the first time to plow into the grass. And they said it even made sounds. It made a sound. Uh, it's a unique ecosystem. And there's any number of books. It's a fascinating, separate little world there that's operating in in the grass. Grasses are a unique, fascinating topic of and of their own. Uh, another little project I had. I somewhere discovered there were 40,000 vacant lots in the city of Chicago, and I took it upon myself. I I was going to turn them all into butterfly gardens, and I even wrote like. 75 gardening outfits. I was going to put together packets of seeds and turn all of these into butterfly gardens, you know. Uh, another thing I've been working on, not too assiduously, is uh, in terms of my own house. I, one time I, I got rid of all my house plants. I had a hundred and some of them in glass shelving on windows. That's like living in a greenhouse. But I got rid of all that. I don't know why I got tired of it. Um, but I took up, I was, my next project is to, and I've been thinking about this for years, is to have a moon garden in my backyard, which is plants that bloom at the moon, you know, white flowers. Uh, but that's my own little project. Uh, another one is that being in public transit. I, my favorite thing is there's, there's a public transit bus which has a flowering garden on the roof. So it brings around the little garden around town as it travels around. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody was talking about moths. I, I killed a little. <laughs> I just took out one of my nicer coats uh, the other day from the closet, and the moth had eaten a hole right in the lapel. Or in the <laughs> so if I get to motherfucking moths, you know. Uh, I, I also say that everyone should be required to try to grow something. I, I think that's an experience that uh, uh, everyone would, uh, would profit by, you know. But anyhow, uh, thank you very much. I had one more thing here to talk about, but I can't figure out what it means. But it will come to me on probably on the way home. But thank you very much uh, for your installations. 
Um, you know, uh, I'm not a landscape gardener. Uh, I have worked with landscape architects. Uh, the, uh, as a matter of fact, I lost an ecological contest to a landscape gardener. So I got something. That, yeah, he designed a garden that was like maintenance free and water free and all that. And my project came in. I got second place on it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but anyhow, uh, thank you very much. Really can, appreciate can I ask it. Ask you a question. Hmm? I see you have a thing up here. That, uh, is there a group of people who are protesting the surface mining? Yes. It seems to be such a travesty. You know, it's terrible. I I lived in West Virginia for many years. What he's talking about is. Uh, but and I remember about mountaintop removal, which they were doing. You know, they come along in West Virginia and chop. Actually, if you go around West Virginia, in certain parts, if you see the mountain, the tailings from the mines, it looks like moonscape. It's unbelievable. You have beautiful terrain on it, and then you turn into this moonscape is the best way to describe it. And then they came along with the mountaintop removal, where they chop the top off the mountain and something like surface mining. And then allegedly restored, but they put in scrub plants and things like that. There was one gentleman who refused to sell all to the mining companies his property. They bought out everyone else, but he steadfastly refused. And he was going around the country uh, energizing people against the mining industry. He just passed away a year or two ago. But I went to hear him speak when he came through town, and uh, you know, I often vacation still in West Virginia uh, um, by choice. So, all right, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm going next, Andy. You're going next, if you don't mind. Okay, come on up. It's uh, very interesting to see the role that uh, flowers have played in our country. And did you know that with a revenue of over $8 billion a year, the flower industry is alive and thriving? The problem is they've seen a slight decrease in annual growth of about 0.4% over the period from about 2008 to 2013. It's kind of a shame because flowers do add a lot to the beauty of this world. For example, there are certain sections of like, I'm on the tollway a lot because I drive a lot to Franklin Park and from Algonquin and from other places. And there are some incredibly beautiful parkway landscapes that drivers can really enjoy when they come into the city or or they, they, they work around some of the stuff. Like, for example, on Route 14 between Barrington and <coughs> Palatine, they've kind of left the highway to natural kind of landscape, and they just let things kind of go a little wild. And believe it or not, it, it does, in a, in a weird sort of way, it looks a lot better than the manicured lawn that you see a lot on various trails. And then I also know, too, that there are certain sections of roadway and signs that really amplify the beauty of, of just the driving experience. Um, we've seen a lot of new sound barriers come up, which means you can't see the side of the road anymore, and it's more like you're in a tunnel. But, you know, with the beautification that, uh, you know, that what was, this, what was her name, Lady Bird Johnson did, but getting rid of the billboards, I think might and should be extended to some of the roadways. It would be nice to see wildflowers on the roadways, figuring in a, in a low maintenance configuration. The thing is, flowers have been a real instrumental thing. In the Victorian times, you probably understand that they were all used for various, to use certain type of flower you'd send to a woman would convey certain feelings of affection or proposals. And in a lot of ways, maybe we're losing our civility because we're not doing that subtle form of communication anymore. 
today it's more open, more, more, more or less, uh, um, you know, here, there, whatever, and they expect you to talk. But perhaps sometimes there is something to be said about sending a woman a nice bouquet of flowers to convey certain feelings of of love or propositions or whatnot. They don't accept. And Charlie. The thing is, and it would be a boost to the economy, but right now, you, you, you know, and, and the best way to do that would be get the fashion industry involved in using flowers again in their, uh, on their models. And I really think that it would really enhance the flower industry. Not only that, but most uh, screensavers that I see in computers usually have a floral type of motif to them. You know, around work. For example, most of your Windows 10 landscapes have some kind of natural landscaping in there, and there's usually flowers involved with it. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, if you really want to see wildflowers in their full bloom, there's a, a one of the Cook County Forest Preserves out in Barrington. It's called Crabtree Nature Center. And there's been many a time I've gone there on a Sunday afternoon with camcorder in hand and met many bird watchers. And when you see some of these guys, they got some of the biggest and best video equipment you'd ever want to see because of the flowering of the, the flowers and the birds and the natural landscape. But you can walk out there and really see nature at its finest. And it does produce a sense of peace and optimism, especially when you're, 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 you're down. And I don't know what, what it is, but there is a certain natural beauty to a good landscaped, particularly with wildflowers, it really uplifts the spirit. I don't know about you, but one of the best businesses of capitalism I've seen is at 1-800-Flowers. A quick phone call and they're on their way. And as a matter of fact, certain countries in Africa that have specialized in the production of certain flowers have seen their economies turn for the better. Now granted, you know, we all like certain things, but maybe it's time to reconsider what our artist friend has said here today and really take a look because maybe more grass isn't the best way to, to do things, but perhaps maybe a little bit more of a wildflower landscape might bring a little bit more beauty and a little bit more civility to the world. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll use my last three minutes here. I, I totally oh, forgot. Wow. For those of you, uh, there's a book that was published in the 70s. I just saw, found it on my bookshelf. It's called The, the Secret Life of Plants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And they did all kinds of experiments showing, uh, you know, with like a EKG machine, lie detector machine that uh, would um, monitor the, the water flow and the stems and leaves of plants if they're, as they're subjected to different kind of music, light, darkness. Well, it turns out that a lot of plants can distinguish between their odor and strangers walking through the greenhouse, among other things. And uh, as our Many people have talked about the whole ecosystem of soil. It's not just dirt. There's millions of things growing in there. And uh, plants of all different sizes, especially the rainforest, they're the lungs of the planet. And uh, those three websites I mentioned talk about uh, various organizations all over the world that are working to uh, save the rainforest and uh, stop the worst of climate devastation that is cutting down the ability of native species to live uh, where they've been living for thousands of years. So they're talking about a, uh, a five-year World War II type mobilization uh, all over the world to get off of fossil fuel and start uh, you know, as we teach, our seventh graders are teaching their parents that the future belongs to solar, wind, wave power, and green renewables, if they have a future. Uh, so, we may not make it, but it's worth trying. 
because there's no alternative. To sit back and say there's nothing we can do about this is a defeatist attitude. And uh, the Want to Know Info site, it's called wanttoknow.info. I have several friends that tell me that when they get depressed, they log on to that site because there's all kinds of hopeful things going on all over the place. It's a clearinghouse of beneficial programs of people of all ages that are uh, working toward a clean, green environment. And essentially, there's a massive, uh, one of the subjects on that um, site is also the alternatives to the disaster of nuclear power worldwide. Oh, yeah. So, uh, in any right. case, um, for those of you that don't know it, the current price of solar panels coming out of many different factories is cheaper, a cheaper source of energy than fossil fuel anywhere on the planet. So the future belongs Please. to solar and wind power. It's happening now, but we don't hear about it in the corporate media. It's no longer called mainstream media in America. It's billionaire-owned corporate media that maintain a certain blend of mythology and ignorance. Two weeks from tonight, uh, oh, there was an article on Common Dreams that talked about the top ten myths that are promoted by uh, corporate media in America. I'll have mm. copies of that and several other copies of a list of blacked out subjects that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than intentionally <laughs> suppressed and blacked out by the media. So once again, if you only for, afford one book this year, other than the censored news handbook that comes out in October, this would be it. Unprecedented Climate Mobilization by Elizabeth Woodworth and David Ray Griffin. It's a summary of the best hundred books or so I've seen in the last ten years on this subject that we're talking about. Thank you all very much. Okay, our speaker gets the last word. I think, are there any, any other rebuttals? I could, rebut, rebuttals, I, I could rebut you with your myths you no, just propagated. We don't have rebuttals personally here. This is for the, <laughs> you want to uh, give a summary? Yes. You get the okay. last word, you sir. You get the last word, so if you have any other thoughts, uh, you want to give a rebuttal to anything that was said by our, our esteemed colleagues here, help yourself. Well, it's been a great privilege. I think you have a great organization going here. We just need to find more of them. I hope some of you will come and help us with our sort of uh, uh, what you all to do. I would like to suggest one group that you might might invite to come and, and talk with you. I think they're very impressive. I think they're called Save the Trees. Uh, and I think that, uh, I don't know who would be the spokesman, but I think maybe I'd do the one, the one younger guy. I recommend that you talk with him. But thank you very much for your very nice com comments. And uh, I have learned for a bit, and I'll appreciate it in the future. And thank you very well with this group. Thank you. All right. Okay. Give us out, Andy. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're through for the night, and we'll see you all next week. We're out.